Hello and welcome to a DM's Guide to the Tomb of Annihilation. With this series, the plan is we're going to take step by step through the Tomb of the Nine Gods, from the entrance, and finally the whole way through the battle with the Serac. Tomb of Annihilation takes place in the region of Chult. Chult is a massive island that's full of tropical rainforest. Best way to describe it is imagine the equivalent to modern day Amazon rainforest. Except this rainforest is full of dinosaurs, skeletons, and scary undead. Campaign can work in many ways, as in the campaign begins in the port town of Port Nazaru. Port Nazaru is full of merchant traders, and that's where all the trade comes into the region of Chult. For the sake of this video series, we're not going to discuss Port Nazaru. We believe that will be for a separate video series. We're going to focus solely on the Tomb of the Nine Gods through level 1 to level 6. And thank you very much, Wizard of the Coast, for releasing this module. And I hope you guys enjoy it. So let's begin. A vine draped obelisk marks entrance to the Tomb of the Nine Gods. This is entrance to the Tomb of the Nine Gods. This is also known as level 1, the Rotten Hulls. We have the obelisk. Why is the obelisk so important? So, number one, a Serax warning. As it details in the description, we know about a 15 foot tall obelisk of cracked stone is draped in vines and black moss. This obelisk radiates a strong aura of abjuration magic under the scrutiny of a detect magic spell or similar magic. And a paladin using defined sense can detect a fiendish presence from within the obelisk. Once you clear the vines and moss the south face of the obelisk, Expose a message carved into it in common, and below is written like so. Fear the night when the Forsaken One seizes Death's mantle, and the seas dry up, and the dead rise. And I, Serac, the internal, reap the world of the living, those who dare enter take heed. The enemies oppose, one stands between them. In darkness it hides, don the mask or be seen, speak no truth to the doomed child. The keys turn on the inside only. As you can see, you have this ominous message, and right here you have my depiction of the obelisk. So it's very straightforward, 15 foot tall, has a message, you've got to scrape away the moss to get to it. As you've seen by the description already, as in defined sense, you can detect a fiendish presence. Within this obelisk, a little easter egg is inside, it contains this demon. Now Feshni. Now Feshni. So, Novesni is a very, very dangerous enemy. So, it is Channel Level 13, it has a lot of hit points, it can fly, it can teleport, and it will be very, very hard to get. For you to release this demon, you need a combined strength score of 60 for it to be released. However, the description does not mention to the players to do it. There's a little Easter egg there. Number one. We have the Tricksters. Alcohols run the length of a narrow tunnel each one featuring a bestial statue standing or squatting above a basin of oil. So you can see here, so it runs from west to east. So as you go through, your characters walk down a five foot wide path. And the first they'll see to their left is Moa, the Adrai. To the right, Wongo, the Sioux Monster. Injin, the Admirai. Obalaka, the Zorbo. Papazol, <laughs> Zoldi, the Ibis. Kuzaban, the froggy moth, and finally on the left is Nang Nang, the grung, and on the right, Shingabi, the Kamadan. So as your characters walk past, if anyone has in their possession a puzzle cube, each of these statues will glow to correspond to them. If your characters have been thorough, they would have went through the entirety of Omu and collected all nine puzzle cubes. So at the end, you've got this ninth one here. This is Unk, the snail frill. He will light up. However, he is currently behind a hidden wall here, so he needs to be searched for. The way this works is all the enemies oppose. So you have Moa, who opposes Wongo. We have Engine who opposes Oblaka. Papazol, who opposes Kuzaban. Nang Nang, who opposes Shungagui. Since Unk is neutral, he has no oppositions. This works really well because it's an actual clue to the false entrance and to the real entrance. Another little thing is, when you search, number two here, Unk actually has a bit of treasure. A golden pendant slaped, shaped like an eye hangs at Unk's statue. It is worth 25 gold pieces and radiates an aura of divination magic. 
If a character wearing the pendant passes within 10 feet of the operating area 1, the pendant tugs the character towards a hidden tomb entrance. Really important. If your characters find this, they'll figure out, they'll be able to find the real entrance and not the fake one. So I'm now going to discuss number three, the false entrance. Right here. So I'm just going to explain how the false entrance works. So your characters walk and you'll tell them this piece of text. A short tunnel ends at a slab of work stone. Those edges are marked by the relief of carvings of grinning skulls. Four lines engraved at the centre of the slab cross one another to form a star. With both ends of each line marking the location of a cube-shaped cavity cut into the door, eight cavities in all. Okay. Just give you some uh, symbolism here. So this is your slab. I'm going to show you a drawing from the side. You can see this is your slab here, and this is what the description details. So eight cavities, and you've got four lines marking the middle. So how does the door work? Well, your characters have to use puzzle cubes. I need to insert it in such a way that all the gods oppose. So for instance, we have Kuzuban here. You place Kuzuban in the middle. He will have to oppose Papazul. We have Shimbagui, and she opposes Nagnang. We have Injun, who will oppose Zorbo. Obalaka, so Injun opposes Obalaka. You then have Moa, who will oppose Wongo. The door will work as long as these guys oppose. So let's say we swap these two around. It still works because they oppose. We can then change the orientation. So let's say we swap Wongo here with Moa. You can see. So the reason why this is a false entrance is because there's no space for Unk. Because you want Unk in the middle, but there's no space. What happens is once your characters have placed political cubes in like so, you can see here, this door will stay. However, the door behind will come down. So your characters will be trapped and this area will fill up with poison and acid. So as we read number three, we can notice that those edges are marked by relief carvings of grinning skulls. If you imagine this is the slab, We've got the door right here. In the centre you have the eight reliefs full of puzzle cubes and you have six skulls on the outside. So I'm going to do a quick illustration. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. When the trap is set, these mice open up and the poison and gas that is here will flood through into the centre cavity. Your players can make a check to block these skulls. Your players have a choice. Do they stay or do they leave? If they stay, they're sealed inside. If they choose to flee, they have to make a DC 10 strength as light check. Any creature that's within must make a constitution DC 15 constitution saving throw or take 1d10 poison damage or 1d10 acid damage. They're then stuck in there for 10 rounds. And yeah, it's pretty dangerous as it has the potential of killing your party very early on. If the player has an idea of trying to sneak through the opening of these skulls, such as Gassi's form, or trying to break this wall down, they're welcomed by a false room filled chamber and they take twice as much damage. So we're looking at number four, which is the true entrance. So on the map, the true entrance is located to the west right here. Pulling aside the heavy undergrowth, you uncover an archery in the cliff face. Stone skulls peer down from the lintel and old bones litter the threshold. As light strikes the entrance, a swarm of bats screech out from within. Nice and scary. The bats are harmless. Jungle predators use this tunnel as shelter and the bones are a mix of grung and velociraptors. And you'll see here we have the nine puzzle cubes. We have Injun, we have Kuzuban, Moa, Shibagui, Unk, Nang Nang, Wongo, Papazul and Obalaka. I hope I've pronounced those all correctly. This is when we come to the first puzzle door, which is... 4A right here. Perfect. A slab of work stone blocks over a ground tunnel some 20 feet from the entrance. Grinning skulls mark the edges of the slab. In the centre are nine cube shaped cavities arranged in three rows of three. As you can see, we have the nine puzzle cubes right here. The puzzle cubes have a story. If you run the campaign from the beginning, you'll go through Omu and you'll find different clues. If you want to run a quick campaign, you just want to do the tomb, you can use the clues in area two right here. So we know that Moa and Wongo don't like each other. They oppose each other. Injun and Oblaka oppose each other as well. Papazol and Kuzuman oppose. Nang Nang and Shingagi oppose as well. Why is this important? Well, they oppose. So you have your three by three 
which will look like this. One, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. As you can see this, yep. Kuzuban opposes Papazol. Injun opposes Obalaka. Moa opposes Wongo. Nang Nang opposes Shingragli. Unk is completely neutral, which means that no one opposes him. So when you fill it in the cubes, as long as it's chosen this way. So for instance, you could have Kuzuban here, you could have Kuzuban there, 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 regardless, as long as he's opposed by Papazol. The way it works in this is because of the lore, you know that Kuzuban is chaotic good, and we know that Papazol is lawful evil, so they oppose each other. Then you have Injun, who's chaotic neutral, and then you have Obalanka, who's lawful neutral. So that's what your players have to do. They have to place puzzle cubes in such an order that they will pose. If you incorrectly place a cube, it will deal 48 lightning damage to any creature within fit 20 feet of the door. And you can use a mage hand spell to place the cubes. Okay. When this happens, the nine cubes flare with light and disappear. Growling like an angry beast, the slab begins to slide up into the ceiling. You now have entrance into 4B. Then you have your second puzzle door. This is when the tomb really kicks off. This is when things actually get very, very dangerous. Another slab blocks the hallway 20 feet beyond the first door, which is this door right here. An iron lever is set into the door's surface with a graven stone skull luring down from above. When a character reaches the midpoint of the hall, you read this description. The jaws, the skull's jaws, creak open and a skeletal hand holding a crystal hourglass style timer emerges from within. With a click, the timer rotates and the sand starts to trickle into the lower globe. As a DM, you now have the job to slowly count down from 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Whatever your characters do in that time, it's up to them. If they pull the lever, <laughs> is, uh, I've done this in a separate tab. So, here is number four. So this is the Torrential. So this is where you walk in, where you use the nine uh, puzzle cube center. Middle, you can see the hourglass, which I've drawn crudely at the top. That's the countdown and your lever is right here. So when that lever is pulled, this bottom floor here will open. This here will crack open five feet. And then you'll fall 20 feet into the spikes. Hopefully that makes a bit more sense. To the south, this is 4-8, so your characters will walk in. I'm going to draw a little character to give you some scale. Let's draw him in black. Give him a little legs. He'll come in from here. Puzzle cubes are in this region here. They walk in. They see a skeletal hand drop down with our glass. They have 10 seconds if they pour the sleeve right here. The floor breaks through and then they fall down into the spikes. If your players decide not to pull the lever and they wait a total of 10 seconds doing nothing, they're welcomed by the door opening and they finally can gain entrance to the Tomb of the Nine Gods. Just to clarify and make sure I don't forget, is that when your players enter the puzzle cubes on 4A, the puzzle cubes will teleport back to the receptacle shrines in Omu. Also, if your players decide to investigate the floor, they have to make a Wisdom 15 DC check or perception to see if they discover the seam in the floor as well. And that's it guys, your players are now have gained entrance to the Tomb of the Nine Gods. So we've explained how to enter the Tomb of the Nine Gods, so let's discuss how we can make it more interesting. One of the things with this is, if you read solely from the book, it becomes almost a game of number crunching, not a game of story. So, first thing I think of is when my players arrive at the Tomb of the Nine Gods. What time of day is it? Is it the morning? Is it night? Is it bright? Is it dark? I need to think of that we're in a dense tropical rainforest. It's humid. It's wet. Is there sunshine outside? Is there rain? What's the weather? And you take these little key facts and you make it your own. What else can we discuss? So if we look at the obelisk in the front entrance, we know that it's very difficult for it to topple and release the demon. However, that still could happen. As in with my advice with this is prep for all of agilities and if it doesn't go the way you expect, take your time, big deep breath, you've got this. As in, DMing is hard, however, the more time and effort you put in, the more you'll get out for yourself and more your players will enjoy it. Thank you very much today for watching this episode. If you've got any comments, feel free to comment below. 
next episode, we're going to actually step into Tomb of Nine Gods and begin the inside of the tomb. And we'll look at the rotten hulls. Thank you very much for watching. And again, give me some feedback. Make this series as best as possible we can. Ciao.